Australia, the great sunny continent of the southern seas, over 30 times the size of Great Britain, yet with a population of less than that of London. 98% are of British stock. A bright young country with lots to live for. We welcome you to share its great future. Not everyone was welcome to Australia's sunny shores. The invitation to come down under was extended only to those who were British and white. For much of this century, successive Australian governments deported and barred entry to anyone whose race they considered undesirable. It was known as the White Australia Policy. Keep them out, keep all the niggers out, Japs and everybody else. Right. Well, we don't want them. Because the coloured races, when they get into a white country, then they um, want to intermarry, and I don't think it's fair on the children. And I, I don't think at all that they should allow coloured races into Australia. When the British seized this vast continent in the late 18th century, Australia became an isolated bastion of the white race. For those early settlers struggling to survive in a hostile land, pride in their British blood meant more to them than love of country. The early Australians were determined to maintain the white man's dominance. The blacks whose land it was were treated with violence and brutality. Chinese workers on the gold fields met a similar fate. Independence in 1901 did not dim the desire for racial purity. The very first act of Australia's new federal parliament was a law to restrict the entry of coloureds, Asians and any other whose race offended. Within a decade, most of the black Kanaki labour on the Queensland sugar plantations had been forcibly returned to the Pacific Islands. Many of Australia's Chinese fled the growing hostility. The population of the country's small Asian communities declined dramatically. For the next four decades, the white Australia policy held fast, upholding and protecting the racial purity of the nation. To many, it seemed, it would always be that way. Australia would always be British and white. The Second World War threatened to change all that by force. With the British in Singapore brushed aside, it seemed that nothing could stop the Japanese march south towards Australia. The Second World War had a profound effect on Australians. It was the darkest hours of our history. It was a real manifestation of the yellow peril. The yellow people came right down to Australia's northern doorstep. As Japan's bombers struck the northern town of Darwin, Australia and its people were left defenceless. Australian troops by 1942 were almost all in Europe, having answered the call to fight for Mother England. The nation was forced to find a new defender. When General MacArthur arrived with the promise of United States military support, he was welcomed with open arms and fine words. We feel that our fate and that of the United States of America are unbreakably linked. We know that our destinies go forward hand in hand. But as the first convoy arrived, it became clear that the welcome did not apply to all. On board were hundreds of black American troops. Local customs officials refused them permission to land. The nation was under threat, but the white Australia policy was law. In some disarray, the Australian War Cabinet met, and the black ban was lifted. But it was to be only a temporary concession to dangerous times. After all, one day the black troops would go home. The war brought another challenge to the policy. Bowing to pressure from the British authorities, 
Australia reluctantly agreed to admit small groups of Asian refugees. They were very uh, great help to Australia during the wartime when there was a labor shortage in this country, when all, most of the able-bodied people, men and women, had joined the forces and went overseas and so on. Mostly Chinese, they proved eager and adequate in their work. Every launching marked their contribution in an all-out war to defeat the Japanese. At the end of the war, the Americans went home. As they left, one thing became clear. If Australia next time was to defend itself, it needed a massive influx of people. The Second World War intensified our fear of Asia. It shaped our attitudes in the post-war years and strengthened the resolve, I think, of most Australians, certainly most of the political establishment, to keep Australia as it was, that is, white. The Chifley Labour government, traditional supporters of an all-white workforce, appointed Arthur Caldwell as the first minister for immigration. To gain public support, Caldwell reaffirmed the white Australia policy and began the immediate deportation of Asian wartime internees and refugees. Japanese ex-internees and prisoners of war board the Daikai Maru en route for their homeland. Old Colburner, she has accommodation even under cramped conditions for 300. She is to carry 2,600. 100 Chinese Formosan women, some with their husbands, and 112 children were compelled to board this hell ship already jammed past the danger point with Japanese they hate. They openly expressed their fear of the fate in store for them. Tearfully, they begged army officers at least for their wives to be spared this nightmare journey. One Formosan attempted suicide, but military police seized, and none too gently, all who refused to board the ship. Their struggles were in vain. Just imagine the uh, state of mind these people concerned were in. Many of them had uh, married in Australia, settled down in Australia, or got good jobs in Australia. And especially when Australia, after the war, needed extra labour. With a population of only 7 million and a birth rate in decline, the policymakers decided Australia had to change from an underdeveloped primary producing backwater to a prosperous nation with industrial muscle and the people to defend it. I was told to, to prepare a plan to bring migrants to Australia. And so um, I coined the phrase, we either fill this country or we lose it. And I gave Australia 25 years in which to make the best possible use of its second chance to survive. The newly formed immigration department quickly ran into trouble with Caldwell's grand scheme. The first shipload of immigrants from Europe provoked surprising hostility. Victoria docks Melbourne. The Misa, first of the post-war immigration vessels to arrive in this country, is awaited by thick crowds giving welcome to friends and relatives. All types from a dozen European countries clutter the ship's side for the first glimpse of the country which is to be their home. Minister of Information and Immigration, Mr. Colwell, has been the target for strong press criticism in this immigration venture. With thousands of higher living nationals awaiting entrance, English, Nordic types and Americans, who can offer this country ideas and culture, it is little wonder that this project has been the centre of a bitter controversy. Let us hope that immigration of the future will be planned deliberately and intelligently and offer more opportunities to the people of our own stock. After such an outcry, Caldwell realised that the only acceptable place to find the right stock was in the mother country, Britain. Thousands of British men and women visit Australia House each week to learn more about our country. They ask questions, they listen to advice. They bring their children. What British migrants were never told was that they too would be secretly subjected to all the rigours of the White Australia policy. The White Australia policy was never, ever, under any circumstances, referred to as the White Australia policy in uh, the Department of Immigration or by the government or in any statement at all. Um, people didn't want to uh, uh, admit that uh, there was some racial prejudice, and so it was called the non-European policy. <laughs>
Non-European was a polite term for coloreds or Asians. It was left to each immigration officer to interpret the true color of the applicant's skin. It became very much subjective uh, to the judgment of the immigration officer. You had the fellow who uh, had just had a holiday in the south of France or Spain. He'd come back uh, magnificently suntanned and find himself rejected because uh, he appeared to be non-European. If I saw him, I might say no, but if you saw him, you might say yes. I mean, you had 50 officers working on this individual assessment program throughout the United Kingdom. It presented difficulties in uh, family selection because uh, sometimes you had uh, one member of the family with a degree of non-European descent. We've even experienced when uh, 12 children in the family, the 12th child was a throwback from uh, grandparents' days when grandfather was a Jamaican seaman, or great-grandfather, and the throwback of the child of the second generation, the 12th child was non-European. That was sufficient to disqualify the entire family. If in doubt, you could call upon a doctor to give us a private opinion to help us make a judgment. As a matter of course, every potential migrant was given a medical examination. But none could have known that they might also be checked for signs of colour. The shape of the eyes was assessed surreptitiously. It was up to the medical expert to decide whether there were traces of Orientalism. You could see, uh, make a judgment as to whether he had non-European blood or not. It's a very, very difficult judgment to make, I can assure you, but <laughs> whether it's justice or not is another matter. Uh, but these, these are some of the things that we were called upon to do in the interest of, uh, uh, of maintaining a so-called white Australia policy. Australia is getting more and more welcome migrants who are greeted by familiar sights and sounds. It's not so unlike the old country after all. You are very welcome as new Australians in our Australian community. We want to see more of your type coming to these shores. We want hundreds of thousands of men like you, and we want many, many thousands of young women too. But the many thousands did not arrive. In the hope of convincing more British that they should migrate, Australia tried another means of persuasion. This time, an appeal for help. The need for more Australians is obvious. The old world speaks of the troubled Far East. For us, it is the very near North. Teeming millions are on our doorstep, while we Australians are so few. The demand for immediate independence here, leading to widespread fighting, is a legacy of World War II. There were very dramatic events in the post-war years, uh, which, of course, caused Australia to be even more uncertain about their future, that these comforting colonial powers, who'd always kept order, one by one were forced to withdraw, and their colonies became independent. And suddenly, there we were in a world of independent Asian states. This new Asia was not something that really excited us. It really caused great fear in Australia, great apprehension that really, at some stage, uh, we were again going to be threatened by peoples from our north. For Arthur Caldwell, the political changes to the north called for desperate measures. The mission on which I am now embarking is vital to the nation. I am going abroad to seek ships for immigrants. If we have no ships, we shall get no immigrants. And without immigration, the future of the Australia we know will be both uneasy and brief. As a nation, we shall not survive. Caldwell told the Australian public he was going to Europe simply to seek ships. But he was about to change the face of migration to Australia. In London, in talks with the United Nations Refugee Organisation, Caldwell agreed that Australia would take wartime refugees from displaced persons camps in Germany. He also pledged 
that immigrants would be accepted without any discrimination as to race or religion. When this promise became known in Australia, it aroused fears that he had scrapped the white Australia policy. Well, I think we should be very careful uh, how we choose them. We must have more I know, but I'd like a house of my own first. But Colwell had no such plans to abandon racial purity. Only carefully selected, fair-skinned Nordic types would be taken from the camps. A team of immigration and military officers were dispatched to Germany to effect Colwell's instructions. We knew we, we were the first, and the selection was very tight. Why it was, we didn't know that time, but we learned it later, and that was the Australian government wanted to make sure that all these people in the first transport are really bodily and mentally able. As the first shipload of refugees left for Australia, immigration officers secretly cabled head office that the mission was a success and that Colwell's instructions had been carried out to the letter. On one matter, the instructions had been quite specific. When we arrived to Melbourne, Mr. Colwell came to meet us, and obviously he was followed by a lot of people from press and radio. And then it started to, to dawn to us that we must be very important because we could see the government really had gone into expenses. Uh, this show was put up, you know, obviously, for the propaganda purpose, to show Australian public that new arrivals are here and what type of people they are. Australia has given us the opportunity to start life anew. We hope you will like us. Look, a lot of people about us. He likes us. <laughs> They had to wear their, their national dress and do their national dances, and these were trotted out on all sorts of occasions. But, of course, at the same time, they were becoming good Australians, and that was the most important thing. It didn't really matter anything about their language. I had to speak English, and we didn't want to know anything about their other languages. Over there in the distance, Christian, is the sea. And over here, stretching far beyond the horizon, is the Australian bush. And that glorious feeling of being free but it is beautiful here. I like it. I like your country. Our country, Christina? Our country. Behind the propaganda was a different story. Colwell signed a deal with local trade unions that the refugees would be given only the most unattractive work, the jobs Australians did not want. Fairness of skin allowed migrants in, but it did not guarantee equality. The government was always concerned to have the program accepted, even though they were never prepared to fight elections or have referendums about the immigration uh, policy or program. But nevertheless, they didn't want to have the embarrassment of failed or uh, dubious or criminal or other elements arriving in Australia as migrants uh, who were uh, seen as undesirable. Different ethnic groups were dissected and categorised as to their suitability. One group in particular, it seems, was not made welcome. I have discovered a secret immigration form which was filled out by Australian immigration officers in Europe and was in use until the mid-1950s. In this form, applicants for immigration to Australia first had to state whether they were Jewish or not Jewish, but it went much further than that. After stating their nationality, applicants had to say if all members of their family were of pure European origin. Those who were not could then be asked for, a sworn statement including a family tree back to great-grandparents on each side. It went on 
applicants should be asked to state whether any member of such tree is not of pure Aryan descent. It's heartbreaking to see that immediately after World War II, Australia was using words and phrases mirroring the Nazis, discriminating against the Jews on the basis of race and religion. It's no wonder that the government vehemently denied using these questions to discriminate against Jews. The head of immigration, Tasman Hayes, came under pressure to explain in 1948 when this document was leaked by an immigration officer to Jewish organisations. Hayes finally replied that the term pure Aryan had never been meant in the Nazi sense, only as it applied to colour. Following this embarrassing leak, Hayes cabled instructions to officers in the displaced persons camps, warning them to keep selection procedures and racial preferences strictly confidential. As a result of this policy, out of 170,000 displaced persons who arrived in Australia after 1947, only 500 are known to have been Jewish. It goes without saying, the proportion in refugee camps was considerably higher. As the ships continued to arrive, Caldwell was the happy hero of the white Australia policy. He could claim credit that Australia's economy was set to boom, fed by this enormous influx of migrant labour. But it was success at a price. Caldwell had hardened his line on non-Europeans during these years. Deportations of Asians, blacks and other coloureds continued, unchecked. Any scheme that can attract and hold the support of 94% of the persons concerned is a good scheme. Did you at any time consider taking a proportion of non-European migrants? No. Do you want to enlarge on that? No. In December 1949, at the height of Caldwell's success, the Labour government lost office and Caldwell was replaced as immigration minister by Harold Holt. Between these two men and their respective parties lay a vast ideological gulf, but on the question of colour and racial preferences, they were as one. Holt pursued the white Australia policy with vigour. The new conservative government, led by Robert Menzies, had been swept to power on a tide of anti-communist fervour. The Cold War in Australia had started. Now, in the early 1950s, Menzies widened the spectrum of the white Australia policy, adding another unacceptable colour. Today in Australia, Reds openly preach their gospel, flout our laws and form a growing menace to the future of this country. Does that disturb you? It should, because today, five-sixths of Europe and Asia are under the iron heel of communism. This imperialistic tyranny is advancing with a speed and power unprecedented in the previous history of aggression. By 1950, it had subjugated 800 million people. We all have laid on us today a duty to be prepared, to be strong. Not with the strength of a bully, but with the strength of a deliverer. The world needs the United States of America. The world needs the British peoples of the world. The world needs every scrap of democratic strength. Menzies seized on the threat of communism to re-establish military ties with Britain. Without hesitation, he opened Australia to British nuclear testing. Menzies firmly believed that Australia was now threatened by international communism. In this Cold War atmosphere, anyone entering Australia could be a foreign spy. The newly formed Australian Security and Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, headed by Brigadier Charles Spry, quickly became involved. The concerns of ASIO and immigration converged. Tasman Hayes requested that ASIO officers enter the immigration department and take charge of security checking. The ASIO chief, Charles Spry, accepted. 
Well, the whole basis of ASIO was the protection of Australia and its territories from espionage, sabotage and subversion. And of course, espionage simply means spying. And um, there was irrefutable knowledge that foreign intelligence services would try to infiltrate people through the migrant stream who would then become agents and operate here. These ASIO officers were attached or seconded or somehow taken onto the staff of the, of the immigration department and the idea was that they were just other immigration officers so that the notion that there was any security checking was kept uh, very uh, quiet. Nobody would uh, dare to query their decisions. If ASIO said reject, well then, a person would be rejected. In the early 1950s, after the outbreak of the Korean War, the main communist threat was perceived to change from Russia to Asia. Communism everywhere seeks to give a fighting edge to hunger and misery. Even now, their eyes are on the rice fields of Indochina, the rubber of Malaya, and one of the biggest prizes of all, Australia. Be assured they will not remain indifferent to the wealth this country can provide. These Asian threats again surfaced before Australians in the conditions of the Cold War, simply because uh, you get a convergence of a fear of communism with a fear of Asians. Somehow, Asians would take to communism like ducks to water because they were poor, and that would finish us off. Reds, it seemed, were everywhere. ASIO turned its attention to the tiny Chinese communities in Australian capital cities. Mostly traders and workers, they were allowed to reside in Australia chiefly to conduct trade with Asia. Suddenly, they were suspected of every type of subversion. Uh, was there a fear that agents might be operating in the Chinese community? Yes, but we were always aware of this and, of course, tried to keep track on elements, say, in the Chinese community which were sympathetic to Beijing and therefore to communism. All Chinese born outside Australia had to wait 15 years before they could apply for citizenship. British had to wait just one. The Chinese had also to prove at all times that they were politically untarnished. Uh, you were always subjected to surveillance by the ASIO officials who come down to Chinatown unbeknown to you and uh, they would have files on most or all of us Chinese aliens uh, in whatever we do and wherever we go we would be uh, sometime recorded uh, because when we eventually apply for residence in Australia, the ASIO file is the most important one which would affect our decision. So uh, I have many uh, friends who were told that they were rejected on grounds which were known to be ASIO reports. Within the immigration department, certain files were kept separate. These were the reports on Asians and coloureds living in Australia. These reports, compiled by ASIO and deportation officers, were all held in the non-European section. They were, of course, more concerned with the uh, law enforcement side of the department in terms of, uh, of deportation and uh, court cases watching carefully that non-European people didn't put a foot out of line. For Chinese workers, with no access to politicians and no influence in the Australian press, it was a tenuous existence. Official action could be swift and brutal. At random, uh, most of the shops and restaurants were subjected to checkouts by the immigration officers and they were there to maintain that the staff members were according to the wage book. So whenever he turns up, we would shout to our staff members upstairs or downstairs, or they may be uh, packing or delivery. We would just say, Iman Kublai, Iman Kublai. So there's a general panic of the whole staff, everybody running in different directions, 
scurrying downstairs and uh, virtually uh, standing still so that the officers can count them, can check them. Yeah, we would just walk into the area and we would cover uh, a number of places all at once and, uh, uh, and uh, we would just ask the people to produce their identification. And uh, if we had any doubt about it, we would take them back to the, uh, to the immigration office. Once inside the offices, the next step was to apply the notorious dictation test, possibly one of the most bizarre pieces of lawmaking in Australian history. It was written into the original Act of 1901 as a device to guarantee rejection of unwanted immigrants. The test could be given in any European language. It was foolproof. That's what it was meant to be and that's what it was. I, I can't remember a, a case where... Uh, Certainly not in my time where we ever had to do it more than once. We always made sure of our facts in the first place and made sure that the, the language that uh, we were going to give the dictation test in was one in which the, uh, the person uh, uh, couldn't pass. The procedure was simple. The person taking the test would be given pencil and paper and asked to write down a section of text read to them in a language they could not understand. An enormous increase in that provided she could be protected against the worst of the summer heat. The Duke would enjoy the yachting. The, the test was applied, it seems invariably, to Asians and coloureds the Department of Immigration intended to deport. Whatever happened, there was only ever one result. I would then tell him that he'd failed the dictation test. If he passed, that doesn't mean he's allowed to stay. He. Uh, uh, we can then give him another dictation test and if he, by some reason, he managed to pass that, which shouldn't happen, but if he did, we could then give him another language and this can go on ad infinitum. <laughs> the deportations of the 1950s did not go unnoticed. The new Asian states began protesting to the United Nations. Within the Southeast Asian community, Australia was being ostracized. In a gesture of conciliation to its neighbors, Australia had agreed to participate in the Colombo Plan. Carefully chosen young Asians could visit Australia to study. Statistics show that Australia is one of the healthiest nations in the world. People of all classes live as neighbours in almost every suburb, for there is little respect for class distinctions, but a great deal of respect for the rights and feelings of the individual. Asian students are liked generally, and in many instances are treated with rather more than the usual consideration because their difficulties in overcoming language barriers and adjusting themselves to strange surroundings are realized. The Colombo Plan has looked on the surface to really help Asian countries to having a rough time. Uh, but behind that, all of that, it was really little more than a charity. And I, I really, I always felt that the thinking behind it was, this was one way of making us look good. We were doing something. Not a lot, but for people, we didn't really want to come and live here. Welcome to Australia, to your new home. Welcome, you people from the South. It's really good to see you. In the mid-1950s, as the Australian economy continued rapidly to expand, the demand for unskilled workers magnified. Again, the immigration department looked to Europe. But by now, the supply of fair-skinned Europeans was drying up and the department was forced to shift its colour line. For the immigration program, the world was divided into Northern Europe and Southern Europe. Southern Europe was the euphemism used for the Italians, the more swarthy types, the Greeks. And when things really became desperate and when the pressure was on to uh, get more people, it even extended to the Turks. Of course, the long-established white Australia policy applied, or officers tried to apply it in uh, countries like Italy, and if they considered somebody was too 
dark-skinned or too swarthy or may have had uh, North African ancestors or something of the sort, uh, then they would uh, normally reject them. In those years, the preference, I suppose, was given to the British component in the immigration intake. This country offers wonderful opportunities for men and women from the old world. And to those who seek wider scope for their talents and resources, Australia may well seem the promised land. It is natural that a British country like Australia should seek as many British migrants as possible to migrate to this country. The many non-British migrants who are here recognize and accept this British tradition, which is the foundation and basis of the Australian way of life. There was an obsession about bringing out British migrants to Australia, and so we had a vast campaign called a Bring Out of Britain campaign where Australians and uh, other people who had come to Australia, perhaps uh, from Britain, were encouraged to bring out their families to settle here. It was, on the whole, it was quite a successful campaign, but it was a mark of um, the concern, the concern of uh, the government and of the Department of Immigration and everyone concerned with it, to reassure uh, Australians that we weren't going to flood the country with foreigners. Off you go now. Don't be late. Bye, Mummy. Bye-bye. These are the people we want. And the more of them, the better. These are the kids, eager to grow up as proud Australians in this great land of ours. A decade after their first British migration scheme had failed, the Immigration Department again campaigned vigorously for their ideal migrants. So we launched into this business of trying to tell people overseas about life in Australia. And I was involved in, uh, I think, one of the first films that was made. It was called The Way We Live. Mum had always to be attractive and never seemed to go to work, didn't work. Children were always well scrubbed. Dad always mowed the lawn. It never rained in our films. The sun always shone. They always went to church. Everybody in our films went to church. They never went to the pub. They never went to the races. They always went to church. But those are the sort of influences that uh, tended to uh, make our films uh, misleading, not by uh, commission, but by omission. Things were omitted. Come over to the sunny side now. Australia, a great place for families. The department's creation of a mythical sun-blessed land lured shipload after shipload of Britons to Australia. A lot of money had been spent, but the campaign was a huge success. The department felt it could parade its achievements with pride. But by the early 1960s, the world outside was changing. The continuing deportations had unified a younger generation of Australians against the white Australia policy. Many had come into contact with Asian and coloured students permitted to study under the Colombo plan. With support from local universities, a group of these students now made their stand against racial discrimination within the Australian community. They staged a drink-in at a Brisbane hotel which had imposed a colour bar. These actions inflamed and polarised opinions. Keep them out. Keep all the niggers out. Japs and everybody Why? Out. Well, we don't want them. I think you have to live in a country with coloureds before you can decide upon it. Um, people here don't live with Aboriginals, do they? But in New York, they live side by side with coloureds. I come from New York, and uh, I wouldn't care to have them living in the same house as me. You see no merit in the white Australia policy at all? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, all this is banking up against Australia, against the white race, and uh, the result will probably be an explosion. The explosion was Vietnam. 
With the British government withdrawing its military forces from Southeast Asia, Australia aligned itself with its Second World War protector. I'm heartily in favor of the American involvement in Vietnam. Are you prepared to I've back... said so time after time. Are you prepared to back this up with, say, a deeper involvement as far as Australia is concerned? Oh, well, look, look, don't ask me what we're going to do in the future, but as you know, we have, in fact, not only supported them, first of all, with some Air Force items and then with some technical advisors and so on, but now with a, with a battalion of the regular army. So our attitude is quite clear. Unwittingly, Menzies' commitment of Australian troops to support America in Vietnam marked the beginning of the end for the white Australia policy. When Menzies handed leadership to Harold Holt, the former immigration minister could hardly suspect that the policy he so passionately supported would be challenged by visiting Americans. Our welcome is warm and tremendously sincere. Mr. President and Mrs. Johnson, welcome to Australia. President Johnson is cheered by more than a million people. The crowd is all the way with LBJ. Although the two nations were again united in war, America now differed from Australia on one fundamental issue, colour. President Johnson had risen to power as a crusader for black American civil rights. Harold Holt would discover that Australia's national policy of racial discrimination was out of step with America's new image. Well, I've uh, met many Southeast Asians who had a lot of antagonisms against your country, more specifically your government, and even more specifically against that on your racial immigration laws. Are you saying that you're going to moderate those even more and more as time goes on? Not one representative of an Asian government has ever raised with me in my many travels around the area the question of our immigration policy. Your country, by geography, is Asian. By race, it is white. And you continue a a pure white immigration policy excluding Asians, your neighbors, from immigrating into Australia. Will that not boomerang against your country? Well, no, we've liberalized uh, the arrangements quite a deal. And uh, the governments of the area uh, recognize the value for them of a secure, stable, and relatively homogeneous Australia. In 1966, when Holt permitted a limited number of well-educated Asians to enter Australia, his decision met little resistance. It was the other side of the government's Asian policy, support for war in Vietnam, that now dominated the public debate. And for once, Asians were attracting sympathy. The Vietnam War was a very important event from the point of view of Australian attitudes to Asia. Because for the first time, we saw not just war on the screen, we saw people. We saw people suffering. We saw a little girl screaming as she escaped from a napalm attack. And I believe this aroused a lot of compassion within Australian society, a watershed in our adjustment to living with Asian peoples. In the late 60s, Americans began to tire of the Vietnam War, and President Nixon came into office with a promise that American forces would in future not automatically be sent to deal with conflicts beyond the borders of the United States. When those conflicts occurred, the countries themselves would have to work them out. Now for Australia, this had very strong implications. It meant we couldn't rely on the United States to be a barrier between us and those turbulent unsettled Asian nations. It meant that we had to start to work on better relationships, more direct relationships with Asian nations. In 1971, Gough Whitlam, the dynamic new leader of the opposition Labour Party, stole the initiative from the Conservative government and became the first leader to visit China. Whitlam's Labour Party was swept to power on a wave of reformist zeal. Whitlam's first promise was to rid the public service of racial discrimination. The minister given the task of reforming the immigration department was the colourful Al Grasby. Al Grasby uh, 
was a bit of a shock for the department. He was a shock for the people who'd worked for uh, so many years along certain lines which they'd become used to. He certainly uh, changed the department. He changed it in a lot of ways. The major aim that we had in immigration was to abolish the white Australia policy and all the other discriminations on the basis of colour or place of birth or ethnic background that existed at that time. In 1972, the white Australia policy was alive and well and it, it permeated every aspect of immigration and citizenship. So we wanted to reform that area right away because it was insulting to everybody in the neighbourhood and it was an affront to the world. Statistics, for example, too, that had previously been uh, kept, perhaps rather unscientifically, on uh, racial background uh, or race, uh, were abolished. So uh, it was no longer possible to, for example, say that among the intake from the United States of America or South Africa, that so many people were coloured or were black or something of the sort because uh, we were non-discriminatory and really we didn't uh, uh, keep records as to who was uh, uh, of what particular racial background or whatever anymore. Grasby toured Southeast Asia to announce that the white Australia policy had been scrapped, a gesture warmly welcomed by Australia's neighbours. But at home, Grasby was accused of opening the floodgates to Asian migration. And the very first thing that I found in Indonesia was they welcomed me and they welcomed the new policy very warmly. But they said, we're happy that you're not suggesting anybody comes from Indonesia because they are short of people. Java, it, now, well, now you ask the question, you're going to get the reply, all of it. In 1974, there was an election. In many ways, it was a test uh, of the acceptance by Australians generally of the abolition of the white Australia policy. Grasby was closely identified with his reforms and soon suffered the consequence. The extremist groups in the community, uh, those that were bent on uh, exploiting racism, had decided that I was to be their major target. My family was threatened. My, uh, I remember getting a letter which said, I hope you die of cancer because of what you have done. And that dreadful half-breed daughter of yours will be found floating in the main canal. The Whitlam government was returned, but the electoral swing against Grasby was massive. After less than two years as Minister for Immigration, he was defeated. When I lost, no one wanted the portfolio of immigration. Whitlam was confronted with people in the cabinet who would not have a bar of it. Their wives didn't want them to be exposed to that sort of uh, attack. Their children they worried about, and themselves and their seats and their, fu and their future, their security as members of parliament. So they didn't want it. Whitlam was left with a cabinet that did not want to have, no one wanted to have immigration because of that, that persecution. So he abolished the department and he took Clyde Cameron as Minister for Labour, added immigration to his portfolio and for the first time since 1947, Australia didn't have a distinctive independent Department of Immigration. The most prolonged negotiations in international politics have finally seen the signatures that bring to a close a most terrible holocaust. The war in Vietnam may be officially over, but the evidence of this blot on humanity still drags on. The end of the Vietnam War reawakened Australia's deeply held fear of Asia, the same fear that had given rise to the white Australia policy 75 years earlier. This time, the fear would not manifest itself as yellow soldiers sweeping into the great South land. Rather, it would be of war-ravaged refugees clinging to waterlogged fishing boats adrift on the South China Seas. So I was given the, uh, you know, given the task of uh, stopping these boats from arriving in Australia. It was pretty simple, I suppose, in terms of reference, but uh, off I went again up to the South China Sea with a team and we located many a boat coming down the 
uh, Malaysian Peninsula. He encouraged the Malaysians to, to land them, put them into camps so that they could be processed. There were still a percentage of the boats, the boat people themselves, who were determined to, to push on to Australia. Well, we took a pretty broad interpretation of the terms of reference to stop these boats. We did, because we had some very capable fellows with the screwdrivers and brace and bit. Uh, we bored holes in the bottoms of the ships and the boats, and they, they sunk overnight. Uh, so they had to be landed. But we, we were successful in stopping a lot of boats by one way or another. Although Australian authorities tried to control the flow of boat people, it was a tide they could not stop. Before long, the Vietnamese boats began arriving on Australia's northern coastline. I was invited out to the uh, immigration chief's home for dinner, and we appeared at his place in Darwin on the waterside, when his wife said, oh, Les, before you do anything, will you go down to the bottom of the garden? There's been a mob of strange people down there all day in a boat. We don't know what they're doing, so we went down, would you believe it? It was a, a mob of Vietnam Vietnamese, a boat that the Air Force, the Navy, had been searching for for days. I'd been in town all day with the Chief and other people, trying to log its progress. They'd got through the Darwin Harbour entrance, came all the way up the Darwin Harbour, and deposited themselves in the garden, the waterside garden of the Chief Migration Officer's home. Here were people suddenly arrived on our shores and there was very little we could do about it. And all our talks of uh, human rights and humanitarian issues suddenly had to become a reality. And we were faced with the situation of people here from Asia who had come here without our approval. And then they had brought to an end, really had brought to an end, the white Australia policy. Formerly, you know, the White Australia policy went years ago. But what we've never really recognised is from the Australian mind, from our politicians, uh, even from our policies, it's never really gone. Uh, we simply don't want to talk about it because it's very embarrassing in this new level of relationship we have with Asian countries. But the fact is, it's still there. Australians are still afraid of Asia. All our lives, we've lived in fear that these large populations will come to the land of milk and honey and inundate our peoples. And until we really recognize it and come to terms with it, we can't deal with it. <laughs>